after yesterday's dramatic tie breaks, uh, the 2019 FIDE World Cup has only four players still here in Huntimansis. From the starting 128, Yevgeny, how do you see the remaining for oh, the semifinals? Wow. Oh, well, so the semifinals start today, and indeed, those four players, they'll stay till the end of the tournament. Uh, well, it, it feels, you know, st I'm still astonished after yesterday's matches. So, uh, well, the games have started already, but still this direct with Vitigov losing on those last seconds, that's, you know. He couldn't understand what happened to him. It was the final game, the Armageddon we are referring to, between Yu Yangi and Nikita Vitigov. Nikita needed a draw only. He won two pawns in the opening with the black pieces. It seemed that everything was going in his way and then he collapsed and he still doesn't know what happened to him he stayed in his seat a couple of minutes after yeah. the game was over not understanding what had just happened to him all right and then oh that's a cruel nature of this tournament so we have to uh, proceed further on the semi-finals two chinese grandmasters ding li ren and yu yang yi playing each other and maxim bashila graf against Taimur rajabov and Maxim also qualified yesterday through the tie breaks against uh, Levon Aronian, the two-time FIDE World Cup champion. It was also a roller coaster game where Aronian sacrificed an exchange. It was a very inspired attacking sacrifice for the initiative. Aronian had the upper hand until he made a mistake with h5 and then blundered the next move. Yeah, right. So uh, Maxim uh, got lucky, I would say, as well as uh, perhaps all the other players, I mean, who are in the, the semi-finals, those who will proceed in the final, there have been a lot of discussions, like chess is such a logical game, so no, you know, no RNG, no luck involved, but, uh, you know, after yesterday's tie break and those mistakes players were making, it's, of course, it's not typical for the grandmasters to such, such terrible oversights, and, but it happens to anyone, right, that, that's, uh, and then, you know, the term of luck in chess, it's like when this, this blank out, this, this mistake is going to happen, will it be, you know, in a friendly blitz game against your friend or the quarter-final tie-break of the World Cup? That is very true. Luck comes and goes and in this field it would be very difficult to get to the finals, to the final four, without having a single lucky moment in chess games. But Kaisa favors the bold, the brave, and I think all these players have earned their spot here in the semifinals with their fighting spirit. And what we see today is the first game, the classical game, between Ding Li Ren and Yu Yang Yi, two Chinese grandmasters fighting for the f final spot, a spot in the very finals of the FIDE World Cup, and the other matches between Maxim Vachelagrav and Taimur Rajabov, a Frenchman against an Azari grandmaster. Uh, right, so we've worked on statistics for those two, uh, those two pairs of players, and while we do have favorites, well, according to previous results in both matches, but just by a tiny margin, right? Yeah, there's to our a calculation. one win difference. Indeed, we have checked the head-to-head -head score between the two Chinese players. They've faced each other 36 times, and it's one victory more for Ding Li Ren. Six to five is their head-to-head -head score. That includes rapid and blitz games as well. And between Vashiel Lagrav and Rajabov, they played only 21 times. I say only because they are older than the two Chinese players. Yeah, and as well, we have to have for nowadays standards, it's only 21 times because as well as classical games, there's, that stats well counts. Rapid and Blitz, a lot of Rapid and Blitz events nowadays, so it's very, uh, very, very normal that the top players they play a lot against each other. It's just that Rajabov, I, I believe, well, for those two, for Maxim Bashelograph and Rajabov, like, even though they're both a bit older, so their peak kind of not matching each other. So Rajabov really had fantastic years of 2012, 2013, almost reaching 2,800 uh, in rating, right? Making it to the candidates in London, the notorious candidates, which was won by the current world champion, Magnus yes. Carson. It was, there was absolutely fantastic tournament to watch. Uh, okay, and then something bad happened to Tamer because in those candidates he got completely destroyed. Yes, and many say that that candidates tournament in London was a key moment in Rajabo's chess career in a negative way, that it may have 
broken him psychologically. Of course, there's no, <laughs> no one um, stating it in terms of he has never said it in an interview, yeah. but um, many suggest that that could have been a turning point if that tournament had gone very well for him. We may have seen a different Rajabov in Absolutely. the coming years. Absolutely, because then for the few years, uh, first of all, he reduced the number of the tournaments he would turn in, let's say, and the way he was playing. I mean, it's not like bad or anything, but he was trying to avoid any single possibility of a defeat, sometimes making like nine draws out of nine games. So, so, and only, only now, like the last couple of years, Timur Rajabov is sorts of back, so back to his attacking style, back to playing normal, playing aggressive. So perhaps that's kind of a second chance for Timur Rajabov. He's one step away from making it to the candidates. That is true, and he eliminated, on his way to the semi-finals, he eliminated none other than his compatriot, Shahriyar Mahmedyarov, who is the number one of his country, Azerbaijan. Right, and, and for Shah, uh, I'm trying to recall, it was already three candidates' tournaments, if I'm not mistaken. I do remember the one in Huntimansis, mm -hmm. for sure, and then the last one in Berlin. Yes. Uh, and it could have been Moscow? That, that's, what, that's the one I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, that's a question to yeah, our lovely okay. community on Twitch and YouTube, if you know. How many times has Shakri Amamadyar participated in the candidates? It's a bit of an irrelevant question for the situation here in Huntimansis because Shakri is out of the tournament thanks to Timur Rajabov. The two are teammates and good friends, but one of them had to go, and it was Rajabov who qualified and now is facing the Frenchman, Maxim Vachelagrov. Yeah, right. And then yesterday's victory of Yu Yang Yi, if we are talking a bit about the other, the other semi-final, yesterday's victory of Yu Yang Yi ensures, uh, well, not only a Chinese player in the final, because we have Chinese semi-finals, so whoever wins, that guarantees Chinese player in the final, but as well, the Chinese participant in the candidates, or possibly two, because for the time being, Ding Li Ren seems to be like 99 0.9% qualified by rating. Yes, but if he qualifies here, his spot from the World Cup will count for the candidates, yes. we are assuming, and therefore someone else would get the spot for the rating, and that could be Anish Giri in that case, for instance. Uh, yeah, right. So, so what I mean, that it could be, technically, that, uh, well, if Yu Yang Yi wins, I mean, that, that's almost guaranteed that two Chinese mm -hmm. players in the candidates, and that'd be, that'd be huge. It would be huge, but I'm pretty sure that Ding Liren has something to say about yeah, that, and he wants no. to win here. Yeah, I, I remember him giving an interview after his victory in Sinkfield Cup, mm -hmm. in one of the Grunches Tour events, and he said, because I, I think, like, it's a technicality, in order to qualify by rating, you have to play in one of those qualification FIDE events. Mm -hmm. And then he said, well, since I'm going to a World Cup, of course I will try to win it. I mean, what's yeah. the point in, in just showing up, losing in first round and leaving? Yeah, I'll try to win it. Definitely, that's the spirit. And in terms of the qualification spots, just a reminder that the top two players from the World Cup will qualify to the candidates, also the top two from the Grand Prix series. And we have one spot from the Grand Swiss that's coming up next month in Isle of Man. Another spot for the top-rated player. That's what we are assuming that it could be Ding Liren, could be Anish Giri. We have Fabiano Caruana, the previous yeah, challenger. but he is already qualified. Yeah, he yes. qualified. So for all those, for all those like two spots from here, two spots from there, perhaps we have to add unless the person who takes it is already qualified. Yes, indeed. And then it goes about the say, the, the weight of events, right? So the World Cup comes first. If you're qualified from the World Cup, that means if you take the qualification sport in any of other disciplines, like, for instance, you win the World Cup and you are winning the Grand Prix. So that means your World Cup uh, place counts, and then from the Grand Prix, someone who takes third place 
is going in, which might be the case with Maxim Vashilogrov, who is performing very well here as well as in the Grand Prix series. Yes, that's a good situation for the Frenchman and very bad for Levon Aronian, who lo lost yesterday to Maxim Vashilogrov because Levon is not doing well in the Grand Prix series. He has just been knocked out from the World Cup and therefore his only chance will be winning the Grand Swiss in the Isle of Man. That is one spot, one chance to qualify to the candidates tournament that's a long shot that's a very long shot absolutely and remember we were discussing that uh, well if it only would be a Ronin but we have like up to 20 people in the same situation who miss qualification point here miss qualification point there and then it all breaks down to this last one last spot from the Grand, uh, Grand Suisse yeah chess is tough speaking of chess let's bring up the opening moves in these two matches this is the semi-finals ladies and gentlemen only four players remain and these four players will stay with us in Huntiman Sisk till the very end of the tournament because even if uh, two of the players the will need to yeah. lose either in the classical games or in the tie breaks they will play for the third place so the third place matters here as well because there is a wild card for the candidates tournament and the third place here at the World Cup the third place at the Grand Prix and the second spot at the Grand Swiss so the one who is just missing out yep. on the qualification on the bubble, they say will <laughs> be right behind the you know the, the, the good places <laughs> indeed that spot will be considered for the wild card for the candidates so the third place also matters a lot here not just because of the price fund Right, on, on the price fund you still have a decent difference of 20k, if I'm not mistaken, between place... Three yes, or, speaking or of price fund, the winner of the World Cup wins $110,000, second place $80,000, third place 60000 and the fourth place 50000 50, 50 000. so it's 10k difference between place 3 and 4, and it's in fact much more than, than take 10k, because you get the chance... The you get the chance to, uh, well, to enter the candidates tournament. So, oddly enough, uh, the match for the third place might have more at stake mm -hmm. than the final in terms of qualification. Yeah, of course, it's, you know, it's a jolly to win the World Cup. And of course, it's some money on the line, but still, both finalists, they're already happy. So the unhappiest man in this tournament will lose the, uh, the match for the third place, arguably. Yeah, that's true. The fourth, the fourth place is the saddest here, but making it to the semi-finals is already a big deal for players like Teimur Rajabov, who has been inactive for a couple of years. We mentioned this candidates tournament in London that may have broken his career in that moment. He's back, of course. He's, he's, he has been proving that even if he skipped a few years, he can, he can show one more time that he's an excellent player. And here he is fighting for the qualification to the finals. And there was an answer about Shakriar Mamedyarov. He played in the candidates in 2012, 2014, and 2018. Thank you so much, Perpetual, for the answer. And shout out to everyone watching on YouTube and Twitch. We do monitor the chat, so make sure that you tell us about your questions and comments regarding the games of today. All right. All right, so 2012, but it wasn't... Uh was there a candidate's 2012? Well, according were, to this, there yes. Were, there were <laughs> matches in Kazan in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. And now I'm going to look things up while you explain the opening. 13, <laughs> yeah, tw uh, 2013 was the first tournament, the tournament in London won by Magnus Carlsen. That was the first uh, tournament on the current format, right? So they've returned to candidate's tournament instead of candidate's matches. So, so he was playing, I'm mean, yeah, remember, I believe he lost to Gelfand, who eventually became a winner of the whole thing. All right, explaining the opening, I'll have hard times here. So e4, c5 doesn't need to be explained, or if it does, it's called the silly in defense, that much <laughs> I can tell you. Knight f3, knight c6, and that's what Taimur does quite often nowadays. So, uh, the idea, of course, is to play the Sveshnikov, if mm -hmm. white goes d4, the Sveshnikov line. And, and therefore a very popular way to avoid the Sveshnikov yeah. is bishop b5, the Rosalimo, that was a thematic opening at the World Championship match in London. Absolutely, and I believe uh, possibly 
And then, not even before the London, yeah, it became sort of a main move nowadays. It's a weird thing to say because that's yeah. kind of a sideline in a Sicilian, which arguably nowadays is more popular than the move D2, D4 that itself. That is true, but that just, uh, it happened in many openings. Also, for instance, in the Rui Lopez, that the D3 setups became very popular, even though it was a sideline. It's kind of, yeah, it's a, a try to sidestep the main, main variations, yeah. which become a sort of a main variation variation itself and all those setups with D3 or with Bishop B5 versus the Sicilian now are uh, really very in, very, very popular. Yes, and so the reason being that the players just want to get a position where it's not theory until a handshake, so many of those very critical and direct lines such as the Sveshnikov or the Marshall, they are so well analyzed that the players don't even make a single move from the top of their head. It's all known, it's all analyzed, it's all theory, and then you sign the score sheet, make a draw, yeah. and that's not what they want, therefore. Yeah, especially, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but those marshals that you've mentioned, I remember like uh, looking at some positions with Switline, and he would say, now it all goes about White has an extra pawn in the Trovish endgame on move 25, and then there is a twist. You can have this and mm -hmm. this. The both draw, of course. Yeah. But the, <laughs> so <laughs> you can imagine, guys, I mean, what kind of analysis we are talking about. So that, that's that is the case, and that's why we see the rise of sidelines such as the Rossolimo or D3 setups in the Rui Lopez. All right, and then, yeah, G7, G6, and in this tournament, I believe we've seen quite a few games which would proceed with Castle, Bishop G7, C2, C3, and that's the way the author of the system, Mr. Nicholas Rossolima, who used to be a taxi driver, by the way, not really? a professional chess player. He was a taxi driver in New York City. I didn't and know that. And in between, he was, he was playing chess. I mean, he was, of course, very talented if you want to... I mean, if you're keen on seeing beautiful chess games, I mean, you can find a lot of beautiful combinations by Nicholas Rossellima. Taxi so, driver in yeah. New York. So his intention was, yeah, to play C3 to take the center and so on. So now, Bishop B5 played with a bit different approach. To capture there, where black has two replies, Bc6 is perhaps more challenging because he will capture towards the center and so on. And then white is trying to restrict black's normal development. In both cases, in fact, if black captures like that, the one, of the, one of the interesting moves is h2, h3, immediately preventing the bishop's development mm -hmm. to g4, and then d3, so white puts the pawns on light squares, trying to limit the c8 bishop as, as much as possible. And it's so funny when you play the, you know, the avatar players in, in this line, and, and someone would go e6, castle short, someone would go a6, and then you would take, and they would take with d pawn, and then e5, and just look at this bishop, yeah? So that's, that's like a, a dream piece. position, dr dream scenario for white. That's, that's what white essentially wants to, wants to achieve, and of course those players, they know how to react. So bishop yeah. takes, b takes. But h3, as you mentioned, that's also for restricting the bishop when it's d takes c6. Yeah, right, so b takes c6, and then the move played in the game is sort of a new take on this position because, uh, well, like a couple of years ago, every single game that would be played here would reach this. Rook e1, knight h6, c3, castles, and thanks to efforts of Boris Gelfand mainly, that they sort of rehabilitated the old line when it was known that perhaps white is better here, but then Gelfand kind of found improvements in this line and, and as, as the current state of the theory said, mm -hmm. this is okay, this is okay for black. Uh, therefore, people started to play some various quirky h3 lines and then there were, once again, h3 and then either d5 or f5, a lot of games on a very high level and arguably black does well. So, d4 was played in a few games, and I got to know this move this August in uh, St. Louis during the Grunches Tour events, when it was first play, played by Vichy Anand, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and then by Maxime Vichy Legrave himself against Magnus Carlsen in the last round game, which Maxime actually lost. So I'm curious to see. Here, yeah, the I'm curious move. to see what happens. So C takes, Queen takes, F7, F6. Uh, so it's bold, but at the same time strategically risky approach from white side, because you, well, exchange 
what happens after d4? You exchange black's double pawn, so black after the exchange has well, quite a nice chain of pawns in the center plus a pair of bishops potentially. Yeah, and you're opening up the position when it's your opponent who has the pair of bishops. A bit illogical, but it's all about the dynamic elements in this position. And white is ahead in development. Queen takes d4 is a direct threat, so you need to react yeah. with a move like f6, which is that's not what that he natural. Did, yeah. That's what he did, because knight f6, I suppose, is not very comfortable uh, after e5. And I'm not quite sure if you want to play c5.